Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Week in Review for March 3rd, 2024. This week we're talking with Dr. Arthur Khachigyan. Hello, Arthur. Welcome back. Hello. It's a pleasure. Welcome to you, Arthur. Uh, so before we jump into our topics, Hovig, you have added a couple of links on our website and also on our YouTube channel. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you may have noticed that we have a new donate link on our website. We'll talk more about it in detail. If you think that we're doing a good job in informing you, if you would like to help us increase our reach, this is your opportunity. Go to the donate link on podcasts.groong.org and you can read more about how we plan on using your donations. And we'd love some encouragement. We have a buy me a coffee link. Even if you just want to buy us a coffee, both Osped and I drink a lot of them. So thank you. <laughs> well, advance. this is this is absolutely true. And uh, the funny thing is, Hovig was just telling me that in Yerevan, somebody asked him if he pays me or I pay him uh, to do Grung or something like that. Let me just say, Grung has been an all-volunteer labor of love on our part for for me, it has been 34 years. And for Hovik, it's been, what, 24 years? 25. I think you joined me. Been, around... uh, tw- uh, 19, 1999 is when I joined. Yeah, and he was a college kid at that time. And, and it just happened. You know, it started during the first Artsakh War. So we just sink money into the infrastructure, running our services and things like that. And we can use a little bit of help to expand our reach, basically. Aspet, before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment and remind our listeners about another anniversary, not a pleasant one, but I think one that we must recall. The Sumgai programs that began in February 27, 1988, stand as a reminder and as a harrowing chapter in the history of Armenians. We have had, unfortunately, too many such chapters. And the Sumgai massacres were a tragic eruption of violence that essentially laid birth to many of the things that we see, uh, we've seen since then. The Armenian population was killed, beaten, tortured, and raped. Uh, these acts then continued in cities like Baku, Kirovabad, Maraga, Shamaki, Shamkir, and Mingachevich over the next two years. These programs did not happen in a vacuum. They were a continuation of Azerbaijani policies throughout the Soviet years that were aimed at clearing Armenians from the region by other means. For those who have forgotten the origins of the Artsakh independence movement, it's essential to remember the pain and suffering of Armenians in Sumgait and beyond. And fortunately, our victory in the first Artsakh war provided the Armenians, including the survivors of those massacres, a home and a reprieve from persecution. However, non-permanent that was. And while today Artsakh is devoid of Armenians, in order to truly complete their genocide, the perpetrators have to erase Artsakh, not only physically, but also from our hearts and minds. We must therefore remain vigilant in preserving the truth and honoring the memory of those whose only guilt was to have an Armenian name or to speak a different language. And we must remain vigilant because attempts to minimize or erase the collective memory and rewrite history are sadly happening and increasing, and not only from the camp of the enemy in Baku, but also, sadly, from our own leadership. Thank you, Ovik. Yep. Okay, let's jump into our first topic. Arthur, last week we were talking with uh, Dr. Sergei Melkonian about the Russian-Armenian experts dialogue that was held in Yerevan on February 24th. So this is where the Russian and Armenian experts discussed the state of relations between the two countries. You were also there, so we thought we'd ask you the same questions we asked Dr. Melkonian. Can you tell us what your overall impressions were of this dialogue? Well, I thought it was a very interesting and sincere exchange of opinions. It made a lot of waves in Armenia. There was a lot of resonance. Uh, A lot of it was very negative uh, because some of the um, media channels associated with these authorities reacted very negatively to the kind of the word of truth that, that came from that meeting. Uh, the Russian side was very open and very clear. In fact, a little bit made me a little bit uncomfortable saying that so you guys paid the price for your Western reorientation. Karabakh was the first part of it. You already paid that and you're going to pay some more. And it was very clear, kind of in your face kind of statement. Were and, they uh, alluding to Sunik by that? Well, they were alluding to something, yeah. Could mm. be Sunik, could be Sevan. Somebody, uh, another expert I met a couple of days ago said that maybe it wouldn't be Sevan. Maybe w- they will start with Sevan. And you know that if they reach the the lake, they're within, I think, 10 kilometers. Yeah. If they reach the... I believe the coast, one of the... Uh, 
I believe one of the speakers said Western Azerbaijan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's maybe a, all of good, our... good, good memory. Good memory, Hovik. That's exactly what he said. You will live in Western Azerbaijan, which means there will be no more Armenia. The dangers are that they will reach Sivan, then Sivan will become a joint kind of interstate lake which means they will be entitled to half of everything that it has, which means that if there will be no fish, the ecology will be destroyed, the lake will be destroyed. And then, of course, m much more importantly, they want the southern corridor and the west supports them. So there are a lot of dangers involved. Essentially, a treaty right. of Alexandropol V2. Oh, yeah. I, t I was talking about it, I think, for the last three years, that there's going to be a treaty of Alexandropol. What, what puzzles me is that we have a population in Armenia that somehow thinks that it doesn't concern it, you know, it doesn't concern them. And I think their plan is to emigrate. Naira Zorabian just mentioned a number a couple of days ago saying 600,000 Armenians filed for a green card lottery, for, 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 participated in the green card lottery. So 600,000 is one third of our population. And um, there's 140,000 Armenians left in the last few years. I forget exactly how many years, like three years maybe. That's that. And I'm also very puzzled by what's happening in the diaspora. I mean, your guys' audience is the diaspora Armenians. I'm wondering, like, what are they thinking? Is everybody just sitting at home and just watching this happen in front of their eyes, calmly kind of taking it in? Uh, apparently, there are some people in diaspora who support this regime. So the questions are not for the Azeris. They are behaving very logically. They treat us like a defeated Nazi Germany. The questions are for our, our community. Uh, what are you guys thinking? Like, what are you hoping for? That That's the interesting part. So, so Arthur, going back to the panel discussion that we had, according to some Russian experts on that panel, Russia is con currently conducting a damage control policy with regard to Armenia. Mm -hmm. In other words, a passive policy. Clearly, I mean, they see their troubles in Ukraine and elsewhere as strategic and primary but to us, it's dumbfounding when they are able to delegate or delay anything they do here until that is resolved. At least that's the common narrative of why they are passive. At the same time, some of the experts on that same panel also blamed Armenia for the worsening of relations. Right. We also heard Lavrov's statement at the Antalya conference where he basically said that if the majority of Armenians support Pashinyan, then we will take more decisive actions, yes. uh, which is in line with these threatening statements. So my question is, were you able to detect any introspection by the Russians? Do any of them accept that their own policies may have contributed to damaging the Armenian-Russian relationship? Or should we even worry about it because they're just, they just think they're an empire and they, could, they get to do whatever they want? As to what they think, I think a lot of them admit that they made some mistakes, and I pointed it out also saying that when they didn't condemn the Azeri invasion of Armenia, that was a mistake and was it was used to the maximum by the local anti-Russian propaganda machine. So I did point it out to them several times, in fact. Yes, they made some mistakes, but of course, blaming Russia for everything when we have a government that surrenders Karabakh without getting anything in return and declares that Karabakh is part of our neighboring state. And then during the war, during the ethnic cleansing, says that it doesn't concern us, we're not interested. It's very hard to blame Russia for anything when our own government has betrayed its people. And that's what they're saying. Like, do you guys expect us to be more Armenian than you? That's their standard argument. I'm not interested in their justifications. The reality of it is that we have ruined our relationship with Russia. The Azeris have not. They have an excellent diplomatic strategy. They have a uh, very qualified diplomatic corps. They have great relations with Russia, great relations with the West. Everybody needs them. Everybody wants them. And we are like the poor relative waiting in the hallway. Uh, so we're back to the 19th century, early 20th century. Nothing changes with us. So yeah, the Russians were very aggressive, very straightforward. They're, you're going you're gonna to pay some more. And they are prepared to not care if we go down. At least that's what they're telling us. Uh, we can keep our part of the Caucasus. You guys can go down. We'll make a deal with the Turks um, because, you know, you're completely unreliable and you don't know what you want. That's what they're telling us. So that's what I wanted to actually tease out. Uh, is it that Russia will, in spite of what happens, or, you know, in, in an act of spite, try to actively hurt Armenia geopolitically? Or do they see it as an expense that they can get rid of protecting Armenia if Armenia decides to make trouble and it's already essentially like going against Russian interests and going against the alliance 
a strategic alliance, at least that we, that we have on paper. I think they're prepared to do both. I don't think they will actively intervene and try to salvage anything they have here. I think they're just going to you know, show us what the consequences will be for this kind of behavior. There are some rumors already that some economic sanctions are in, you know, in the pipeline. So there will be some economic sanctions coming. I think they'll just punish us for it. And then if we still persist in it, they'll just withdraw. I think they will. They're not going to fight for us. They're certainly not going to fight Turkey and, and Azerbaijan. Turkey is a very important country for them and for the West. Uh, Turkey is a part of their strategy of creating a counterbalance to Western influence. I mean, I think it's a mistake, but we can't tell them what their policy should be. They are the ones who decide that. They have a very strong pro-Turkish lobby. Our behavior has given them all the grounds for considering us completely unreliable and ir irrational state. So uh, a lot of them are inclined to cooperate with Turkey, and if need, need be, I think they will draw from here. I don't think Russia is going to launch any kind of a major intervention here. Arthur, Sergei mentioned that Russian analysts generally agree that Russia's decision to not support the Armenian opposition in 2021 was a mistake. In fact, you were um, slightly involved in uh, 2021 with the opposition. Do you have any thoughts on that point that you can expand on? It's hard for me to say. In 2021, I made some attempts to help the opposition, but I wasn't really in the process of preparing for elections or creating some kind of strategy or, or you, know, you know going out talking to people I, I wasn't part of it but I, I did i made some attempts what i hear from a lot of people here is that yes russia didn't really uh help the opposition and in a way it actually helped this guy because this guy makes it very convenient for russia he constantly gives in he makes concession after concession so russia doesn't have to fight for anything it creates an alibi for russia to give in so that's what I've heard. It's hard for me to say because I don't I don't like to talk about things that I don't know from like personal knowledge. But that's the theory I've heard is that they prefer this guy, at least they preferred him in the past. At the time. At the yeah. time, yeah. Because he was, um, I think it was that Pashinyan was at the time still helping implement the trilateral agreement. So they were okay with him? Yes, yes. And, you know, I think one of the things that definitely helped Pashinyan prior to the election was uh, Putin basically uh, being all warm with Pashinyan. Uh, we can see the contrast with today. He said that Pashinyan is not, I don't believe Pashinyan is a traitor. Um, we also, you know, people drew a stark contrast between the involvement of some Russian companies and the Russian community in Armenia in the 2018 um, coup. Yeah, everybody and, talks about uh, it. Yeah. You know, huge, yeah. Yeah, huge companies like Gazprom and whatever. Yeah, I don't want to name names, but you know, it seemed like there were a lot of employees of Russian companies out on the streets as well, marching. Uh, meanwhile, none of that was happening in 2021. Uh, so that's another uh, data point that the opposition uses to allege that uh, Russia uh, not only did not do anything to against Pashinyan or to help to help the opposition, but also actually helped Pashinyan in 2021 as well. Uh, let's move on now. Just this past week, in highly publicized comments to the Armenian parliament, Pashinyan said that he is ready to pull out of the CSTO and that the CSTO has become a security threat for Armenia. Obviously, this is not the first time Armenia has been taking pot shots at the CSTO and Russian military presence in general. And to France 24, in an interview two weeks ago, he said that Russia had fomented unrest in Armenia after the ethnic cleansing of Artsakh in September 2023, hoping for a regime change in Armenia. What was the sense of the experts at that discussion about such comments from Pashinyan? Yeah, I admire the strength of your nervous system. I cannot bear hearing his voice. I cannot bear hearing this guy. But yes, I've heard it. The style, this group has, has a certain style of doing things. They constantly change their story. They change their story. They come up with new justifications. Now they're saying Russia did everything wrong since 1991. It's all Russia's fault. It's very childish. These childish justifications they find from their, for themselves. Uh, I don't give any credence to, the, to these statements. I don't think Russia is interested in changing any regimes here. They constantly blame Russia for wanting Armenia to be part of the union state with Belarusia and uh, Russia. That is not the case. Russian experts and 
uh, statesmen have repeatedly said that this is not what we want. We don't want you as part of the union uh, with Belarus. We don't like. We don't want that idea. So this is. They keep coming up with these very pathetic justifications. Uh, it's constant informational manipulation. They constantly change their story. Uh, one day we are the most pro-Russian regime. The other day Russia is a threat to our security. We're going to, call, you know, they want to remove the Russian border guards at the airport. Then they're going to remove them from the actual uh, border with Turkey and Azerbaijan. And then it's, of course, they're going to close down the base. What's interesting all of the, is that all of it happened after he met the head of uh, the British intelligence, Richard Moore. Once he met this guy, then... Uh, he came back and all these aggressive anti-Russian steps followed. It's it's difficult not to conclude that this was a result of that meeting. Arthur, in the context of the West versus Russia impasse, French-Armenian relations were in the news last week. We talked at length about it. But given that we have Arthur, Arthur, you recently interviewed the deputy editor of Le Figaro, a uh, French uh, newspaper uh, who is very influential and has the company and has the ear of uh, Macron and other French leadership. It was a very interesting interview. We will link to it from our podcast. But I wanted to just sort of ask you what your impressions are. What is the takeaway from that interview? What did you hear the deputy editor of Le Figaro say that our listeners should hear? In short, he is one of the greatest friends of our people in France. He loves us. He is more, much more patriotic than most of the Armenian population. Uh, so he said, we love you guys. You know, I'm your friend. I was talking to Macron about helping you, doing anything we can. But the French people are not going to die for Armenia. We cannot justify it to our society. We cannot explain to them why French guys are going to go and die for Armenia, nor can we risk a war with Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Russia. That's not going to happen. And then I questioned him on this delivery of these ridiculous armed personnel carriers made of glass. And he agreed with me that these are transport vehicles that France no longer uses. Ukraine turned them down, and they're mostly exported to African countries and used for reconnaissance missions. So it's a complete PR campaign. We all love France. Nobody loves France more than I do, but they're turning this into yet another PR campaign slash fairy tale, again to manipulate the public opinion. Okay, um, let's turn our attention to the negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan a little bit. This past week, Mirzoyan met with Bayramov in Berlin. Right. After two days of discussions, apparently no results were achieved and, quote, open issues remain, unquote. Azerbaijan is demanding Armenian legislative and constitutional changes, and at least in words, these are preconditions for signing some kind of an agreement. We don't even know what the nature of the agreement would be that Azerbaijan would be willing to sign. Right. Pashinyan's government, also at least in words, is rejecting this. Note that they are saying that they're not going to make the changes to the Armenian constitution to meet Aliyev's demands, but they're saying that the changes are not related to the demands by Aliyev. So the question is, where do negotiations with Azerbaijan stand overall? What are these so-called open issues that Foreign Minister Mirzoyan was talking about? And why is nothing being achieved? Uh, my understanding is that they're treating us basically like the defeated Nazi Germany or uh, like the de uh, defeated Japan after World War II. They want complete submission, capitulation. They want to rewrite our constitution. We have to give up our history. We have to give up certain of our, you know, names for, of our streets. We have to give up our national heroes. We have to rewrite our history books. Uh, it's a very far-reaching program. Uh, that's how they're treating us. Uh, what is astounding is when this is that when he, this guy went to Prague and surrendered Karabakh, he never got anything in return. It is absolutely astounding to make a concession of this magnitude and not have anything from the other side. Right now, it's very difficult to understand what they're negotiating about. This is what they did prior to the war, if you remember, in 2020. You, no one could understand what they're trying to do. It's this constant, it's the same pattern of manipulation, lies, playing with the public opinion, and finding someone they can blame for all of it. This is, this is how they function. It's their modus operandi. They always work this way. So with what you're saying, how high is the risk of war on Armenia now that negotiations apparently are more or less stalled or just uh, treading water? Well, judging by the fact that Russia warned its citizens not to travel to southern Armenia, 
and that the, the threats for threats from Azerbaijan keep coming in and Israel is continuing to supply them with weapons. There are all these flights now from Azerbaijan to Israel and to Nakhichevan apparently. So yes, it's pretty risky. It's pretty dangerous. And we have this paralyzed society, completely paralyzed people. They're all worried, but no one wants to do anything about it. No one. It's like it's happening to some somewhere uh, somewhere else. I think people think that somehow by some miracle, they will escape if something happens. Well, to me, that says that there's a lack of leadership. Total, total, definitely, definitely. If you talk to people here, yeah. they're very disenchanted with the former leadership and they don't think this guy is any good either. So it's pick your mm -hmm. poison kind of a situation. Therefore, people are just, they lose hope. They're very apathetic, uh, very desperate. And I think most of them just are just hoping to get the hell out of here because they don't believe that we will have a competent leader. So from Munich, about a week and a half ago, the foreign ministers flew to Antalya, pretty much direct, for the annual diplomatic conference there. Yeah. Mirzoyan met with the Turkish foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, and reportedly discussed normalization. Turkey has made it clear that normalization won't go forward until Armenia capitulates to Azeri demands. What I read in their statements is that until Armenia hands over Sunik to Azerbaijan and becomes a city principality centered around Yerevan, That's right. nothing's going to move forward. Yet Pashinyan's government goes around in circles promising and, you know, hoping that progress will soon be made and Turkey will open a land border with Armenia. So first of all, why? Do the Armenian people, in your opinion, believe that an open Turkish border is going to be some kind of a panacea for something? I mean, are there, what are the expectations? Let's start from the last part. Yes, they do. They are convinced that once we open the border with Turkey, Turkish goods and money will start just flowing into Armenia and it's going to start raining Turkish liras and everybody's going to be rich. We have a consumerist society right now. We have a society of consumers in Armenia. Instagram and TikTok are more native to them than this country. They spend most of their time online. This is actually one of the negative aspects of globalization. Yes, they do. They believe that opening the borders with Turkey, surrendering to Turkey, kind of accepting the inevitable is the way to have the sweet life. They want the sweet life. They want the Dolce Vita, a lot of them. And even though most of them are completely disillusioned, disillusioned in this guy, they still believe that, yeah, we can't fight anymore. We just have to surrender and we will be okay. Now, going back to the first part of your question, why is it that the Azeris and Turks are very clear that they want the total surrender of Armenia, which will lead to, as you said, the principality of Yerevan, and then that will also disappear. Their objective is to make Armenia go away, to reverse the process that Russia started in 1828 when it brought Armenians back to certain parts of historical Armenia and established the Armenian gubernia. They want to reverse all of it. And this network of propagandists is part of that effort to completely brainwash our population. So why is Turkey and the Azeris, why are they so clear and why is our leadership so manipulative? I think it's because they know they have failed. They know they led us to a catastrophe, the worst catastrophe in 100 years. They know it and they're desperately trying to find any way of convincing this population and themselves that they haven't lost everything, there's still some hope that we're still going to get Turkey and Azerbaijan to say, oh, okay, you guys, you surrendered, now we're going to be nice to you, they, because that's what they promised to us. They are basically in complete denial. They are in denial. This whole group, which, by the way, reminds me of a religious cult, they are in denial and they convince people to be in denial, to deny reality, to ignore what Aliyev says, to ignore what Turkey says, to ignore the threat from Russia, to ignore the threat from Turkey and just live in this cloud nine land. It's like, it's like they're all on drugs, completely denying reality and believing that their savior, and you know that some people in Armenia still think that this guy was our savior, that he has some magic solution. They're just trying to stay in power. They're just trying to brainwash our people. In Antalya, Lavrov and Bayramov also met. Yes. Guess what they talked about? They highlighted their agreement about the importance of implementing the November 2020 trilateral agreement. Certainly, they are talking about point nine, I think. Yes. There has been a systematic failure to implement that agreement from points one through eight. If I were to be the leader of Armenia, I'd be responding that we can talk about point nine right after we get points one through eight implemented. This means 
putting 144,000 Artsakhsis back in their homes, opening the lachin Berzor corridor, repatriating Armenian POWs back to their families, and a lot more. Arthur, what's an appropriate response to Russia and Azerbaijan about this trilateral agreement pressure? Well, if they want the trilateral agreement to come back, they have to come back to the trilateral agreement. Azerbaijan has completely changed the whole situation and violated the agreement. So has Armenia. We help them do it. We help them do it. It's very difficult to deny the reality of what happened. This government is under foreign influence. This group is under foreign influence. It was not in Armenia's interest to surrender Karabakh. It was certainly not in Karabakh's interest to be surrendered. This government was just a following foreign strategy of destroying Karabakh, making Armenia dependent on Turkey and Azerbaijan, and thus forcing Russia out of the region. That's their task. That's the task they were charged with. The fact that they keep meeting with foreign representatives, including foreign reconnaissance services, for the second time they're meeting with more. How many foreign leaders do you know who are meeting like foreign intelligence agencies head, you know, directors? I am not aware of it. <laughs> yeah. So ours is highly publicized. It's not it doesn't just happen. It is highly like an in your face yeah. so public effort. They're taking the lead from British intelligence. I mean, I love Britain, I love England, I love everything about the culture, the language, the history, but I don't want their intelligence agency to run our foreign policy, especially mm -hmm. when it leads to the ethnic cleansing of our people and the submission of our country. This is what they want. Politically, England is not our friend in this region. Sadly, it's not. It's the friend of Azerbaijan and Turkey, not ours, just like 100 years ago. It hasn't changed with a you know brief interlude. So this is a foreign strategy. This is a foreign order. They're filling in an order that came in. Destroy Karabakh, force the Russians out. The next one is going to be force Russia out of Armenia and then become a vilayet of Turkey. And then we're going to go back to the letters of uh, the 19th century, begging the West to help us and the, the West turning a blind eye as usual. Um, Arthur, earlier you had said that Russia sees Turkey as a counterbalance to the West. But I question how far can that theory go in case of more acute conflagrations? Let me read another statement heard in Antalya, and I'm quoting. In addition to the involvement of the EU, we're also waiting for Turkey and its regional leadership to become involved. Ankara can have a strong influence in opening communication channels in the region and asserting the role of its dominant power in the region. That was Toivo Klar, EU Special Representative for the South Caucasus. Your thoughts on that statement? My thoughts on this statement are that this is something that we've been talking about for the last 35 years. So asking me now, why is it so, makes me laugh. And I know you know it, and I know Asped knows it. We have right. been saying it for the last 35 years, that the West is going to hand this region over to Turkey to balance Russia, force Russia out, and have Turkey manage the region, which would result in Armenia's annihilation and in declarations from the West. Just like they said, the ethnic cleansing of Karabakh is not acceptable. And a few days later, they were shaking Aliyev's hand and congratulating him on his election, re-election. So we have been saying this for a long time. Why did people not want to understand it? I don't know. But now we hear it loud and clear. They want Turkey to be the boss because they want Iran out and they want Russia out. Do you think that the same fate awaits Georgia? By any chance, if I were Georgia, is Georgia in as much trouble as Armenia is? If I were Georgia, I would think very carefully about who is going to come next, because as the Kurds in the Ottoman Empire found out, after they ate Armenians for breakfast, they ate them for lunch, and now they're you know busy fighting for their own existence in Turkey. So if I were Georgian, I would think very carefully about what's going to happen to them once Armenia disappears and Turkey and Azerbaijan unite and and turn their gaze northward towards the north because then uh, georgia is going to be the next little sandwich they're going to want to chew and they can they have like 95 million people georgia has like four i think they're also very small and then if i were russia i would think very carefully about where turkey is going to go next with its ottoman empire but we can't talk to russians this way they don't like it and we shouldn't explain to them what their interests are we should at least try to be reasonable and rational in our own foreign policy. And this is not a rational foreign policy. This is a tragic sitcom. This is not a foreign policy. This is a disaster 
one disaster after another with complete complacency from the diaspora and from the Armenian people. So my question is not related to questioning Russia's motivations with regard to Turkey. But geostrategically speaking, obviously Russia also has made some calculations in its relationship with Turkey. Yeah. So is it reasonable for even Russian officials, in your opinion, to question Turkey's loyalties to the West and NATO? I mean, how far, how much, if this thing goes, uh, if the, you know, uh, Mert hits the fan, yeah. excuse my French, how much can Russia rely on Turkey? Let's forget about Armenia, you know. Just Russia-Turkey relations. How much can Russia rely on Turkey? Of course, Russia understands that it's, it understands that it's a dangerous game. Of course, they know this. But in this situation, they have no choice. They are dependent on Turkey. Their existential enemy, sadly, is the West. And in their war against the West, they need Turkey to help in some way. Until recently, Turkey was their main gateway. To the outside world, they were selling their gas and oil through Turkey, and all a lot of their import or re-import, illegal import from Europe and the West is coming through Turkey. Turkey's trade grew by 100%, by 200% in one year. They are dependent on Turkey. So it is understandable that they're making a temporary concession to Turkey at our expense. It's it's ugly, but it's understandable. It's realpolitik. But eventually, of course, they, they, they would rather not give the whole Caucasus and Central Asia to Turkey because Turkey, when it you know creates its empire, it usually looks north. And Turkey hasn't given, given up its claims on the Crimea, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a forced compromise, I think. And that's what they're saying. But in any event, we should first start with our own policy and our own government because we don't have one. We have a bunch of hysterics who have nothing to do with real policy or rational thinking or calculation, who have ruined everything they could have ruined in six years, and they're still blaming the previous regime for it. The problem is with us. It's not with Russia. Yeah, I, I think actually more than can Russia trust or uh, rely on Turkey, Russia can expect a reliable response from Turkey. They're expected to look out for their interests, and they are absolutely looking out for their interests. So in a sense, they are a rational actor on the geopolitical stage. So Russia can rely on that. They know how the other side is going to respond. Yes. Unlike Armenia. Yes, Turkey is predictable. It's logical. Yes, sometimes it cheats. Sometimes it doesn't fulfill its obligations. Like I said during the conference, and then this ridiculous government picked up on it. They don't. They didn't even understand that I was making, making a point to the Russians. You you were cheated. That Turkey deceived you. That's what I was trying to convey. And of course, these government. They they don't. I don't. I wonder if they graduated from fifth grade. They didn't even <laughs> understand my sarcasm. They. It's unbelievable who's running our country. Because I told Russians, yeah, you're playing your game with Turkey. We understand. But they cheated on you, didn't they? Because Finland and Sweden were allowed to join NATO. They cheated on you. I mean, look how smart the Turks are and how manipulative. They got their F-16s from America, even though that was temporarily on hold. They got their uh, concessions from Russia at our expense, and then Finland and Sweden still became part of NATO. They still allow some NATO uh, uh, military ships into the Black Sea. It's like they have everybody, you know, they play everybody. They're playing everybody, the West and Russia, and they get everything they want. Okay, let's uh, jump to... Other political news. Since 2022, Edmund Marukian has been the, quote, ambassador at large for Pashinyan. Uh, most of what we see as output from him are tweets and statements that generally appear to be something Pashinyan wanted to say, but didn't want it to come from the prime minister's office. Uh, despite the fact that Marukian led the opposition bright Armenian party, Lusavur Hayastan in Armenian, most observers do not consider him or the party as a true opposition to Pashinyan. And on Friday, Marukian resigned, citing quote, foreign policy differences as the reason for parting ways with Pashinyan. And he has not elaborated on what those differences are. Just quickly, do you see uh, this resignation or the parting of ways to be something serious? Or could there be more a more hidden agenda between uh, behind this resignation? For example, we read in a 168 AM article, which was speculating the possibility of Edmond running for office in a presumed early election. I somehow suspect that he's going to do what Vartan Hukasian, the dog, uh, I suspect that he's going to do what he did, pretending to controlled be opposition. controlled 
opposition that's later going to hand you over the votes. I, they used this trick before. I don't trust this guy. Armenian politics is just a bunch of people lying and manipulating each other. But uh, he has he's been very manipulative and he's been slipping in and out of that role for many years. Hovik, you would know more about this. But somehow I find him very untrustworthy. And I think that's what he's trying to do, to pretend to be the opposition, fake opposition, uh, who, who will later maybe collect some votes and get some kind of political standing here, later to hand it over to Nicole. Right. What was interesting for me was that you know, he said foreign policy differences, but I haven't noted any foreign policy change or market change uh, from Pashinyan over the last year. So why now? You know, some others are speculating that it may be because there's nothing left to gain and people don't want to be associated with further capitulation from this regime. But can you detect any change in Armenian foreign policy over the last year that would cause uh, Marukian to resign? Maybe there's a small chance that these concessions went too far. I mean, after all, we're talking about our country disappearing. He wants the enclaves. He wants the roads to those enclaves. He wants part of Sevan. He wants the south. And he's talking about certain neighborhoods in Yerevan. So it's possible that it went so far that he suddenly, you know, had a kind of a reawakening of his conscience. I don't know. I would say it's very unlikely, but maybe. Most likely he is just doing what I what I said he was doing, just splitting away so that he could uh, paralyze the opposition and then bring the votes back to his boss. Just for the record, my own narrow interest is that Edmund Marukian is still, I believe, a member of the commission to rewrite the Armenian constitution. And we know that at least that was on the agenda uh, so far. And, and I, I don't know if it has been removed from the agenda. And I asked Marukian whether his membership in that commission will also be uh, rescinded. And we we talked to Marukian also more than a year ago on, on this podcast, specifically asking that question on what he feels about the Constitution. And for the record, you know, just you can go hear that interview. But for the record, Marukian at that time, had said that he is not a proponent of changing the preamble to the Constitution. So it will be interesting to see if that position changes at all recently. I think that may be another indicator of you know how serious this rift between uh, Marokian and Pashinyan is. It's possible. I mean, it's possible. There was something else between uh, this guy. I don't even want to pronounce his name. And uh, remember the so-called chairman of the National Assembly, whatever it's called, the parliament? There was some kind of a rift there. His relative was arrested for corruption. Alan Simonian. Yeah, I didn't want to say that name. Uh, so I don't know what, <laughs> what came of that. This is, a, this is a tragedy. It's a tragic comedy. This is a tragic comedy. When you, when you listen to them speak in the National Assembly. Or perhaps a comic tragedy. A comic tragedy, yeah. And probably, you're probably closer to the truth. When you listen to them debate ridiculous things in the parliament and, and like curse each other out and throw bottles at each other, it is just so pathetic. Yeah, like sometimes I really wonder, like, maybe our enemy is right. Maybe we really shouldn't have a state. And there's a reason why we didn't have a state for thousands of years, because we, we don't have it in us. It's very, very depressing. And it's it's even more depressing to yeah. see how people are very passive in the diaspora and here. I was walking in the, you know, the Kaskad, you know where that is. And I see an Armenian guide leading like five or six Russians. And he goes, oh, yeah, and Artsakh is gone. So things are just fine. He actually said that. I, he was smiling. He's like, yeah, we got rid of it. Things are going to be great now. You know, it's like a mass psychological disease. It's like a, that was an Armenian oh, saying that an or Armenian Russian? saying mass to psychosis. the Russians. Yeah. It's a disease. It's a disease. We're the nation of Komitas. We're the nation of Tumanyan. We're the nation of Parush Sevak. An Armenian guy, 20 year old guy is like, oh, yeah, we got rid of it. It's going to be just great. He's, he's telling the Russians. The Russians are more concerned about Karabakh. There are some Russians I talk to who are more depressed about the loss of Karabakh than Armenians. I know them. Like, I know them. They're sad. Arthur, I, I, I don't want to generalize that across all Armenians. Although even one person who, to me, one Armenian who does not feel intense sadness or does not realize that we, what a genocide, you know, continuation of the genocide that we've had, 
one Armenian is too many, in my opinion, and we do have more than one. I could not agree. But more. I don't want to. I really don't want to generalize that across all Armenians. You're totally I think that right. Many, at least, I didn't say all Armenians were like it. I just said this yes. is what I saw, and many of yeah. them, many of them, including including some of my friends and family members, have the attitude: we finally got rid of this problem. Now we're going to live happily ever after. A lot of them say that. Well, now you know. Given that this is uh, this week, last week was March first. We remember that in 2008, Pashinyan was saying that this is a time to finally get rid of those, uh, I believe, Takank scum, uh, Gharabakh. I, I hate that I'm repeating those statements, but get rid of those Gharabakhtis. Get, get rid of those slur Gharabakhtis. And this has been a strategy. This has been a public narrative that has been fomented over all these years, and it has come to its fruit, and hobby- unfortunately. And the same people involved in 2008 we're involved today. You know? Don't you think? I, don't you I, think I, that it was funded by foreign countries? Do you know where this money is coming from? Definitely, of course, of course, of course. And it didn't start in 2008, but people who uh, are acute of U.S. and Western influence in the region, in Ukraine, in Georgia, know that all those things happened. You know, in the early 2000s, and it can't be that U.S. policy in Ukraine in the 2000s was that of fomenting this uh, these revolutionary sentiments and uh, supporting, you know, excuse me, these far-right fascists in order to have what we have in Ukraine today, at the same time was doing nothing in Armenia. And it was doing, you know, in Georgia, in Ukraine, but nothing in Armenia. So, of course, it takes an absolute novice in politics to be able to believe that the U.S. was not involved in Armenia as well. Arthur, you said we are children of Gomidas, children of Tumanian. Yeah. I was reading Tumanian a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to read you a quote from 1913 in English. He writes... I think I, I know the quote. I think I've seen it. Go Long ahead. live glorious Kharapag. May her sons be as tall and unshakable as her prodigious mountains. Yeah, yeah. We, we just okay. said goodbye to So her. anyone who claims to be Tumanian blooded, think about what he wished for our nation 111 years ago and we will what be you're back. doing We will be it. back. And next year in Shushi, we have to live with that dream. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but this life is not worth living without that. Let's wrap up our topics here. So as usual, I'd like to ask each of you if there's something on your mind from the past week that you can share. Hovik, why don't you go first this week? Uh, so, yeah, going back to this Russia versus the West rift, you know, it's just incomprehensible to me at how suicidal or maybe just inimical these people that are ruling Armenia are today. Uh, you know, in the past, we've heard that UK has said that they might send troops to Ukraine. Francis Macron, you know, he shook up the entire sort of EU news cycle by saying that France is, uh, wants to or is ready to send troops to Ukraine. It was toned down a little bit later by Germany's Olaf Scholz, but Dmitry Medvedev today said that Germany is preparing for war with Russia. I saw it. Uh, Putin again hinted that the nuclear option is on the table and they will go for that option if the West does not stop. So in the context of all this bellicosity, what the hell is Pashinyan doing cohorting the MI6 CIA leadership, doubling down on Armenia's engagement with the West, which is at the detriment of engagement with Russia, as we see from statements about exiting the CSTO and blaming Russia, uh, sometimes with reason, sometimes without reason, most of the time without reason, legitimate reason. Oh, we can know just, exactly uh, what he's doing. You know exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. He got an assignment from MI5 to open a second front against Russia in the Caucasus, just like they're opening a third one in Moldova with Transnistria, and they're trying to provoke something in Kosovo and Serbia. They're trying to suck Russia in. They see that Russia is winning in Ukraine, so they're trying to open more and more fronts against Russia. But don't, like, to so, so let's say, but we're I mean, let's say the, 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 to agree to be involved in it. And that's my point. Let's say the discrete list of traders, of people who are on the payroll of foreign governments acting against the interests of Armenia, I mean, that can't be like a in the hundreds. I mean, what are the rest of the people thinking about? What is all these people who still support uh, Ukraine, who still support Pashinyan thinking about? That's a you know, thing that I can't solve for myself and I always struggle with. Arthur, what's on your mind? What's on my mind? Well, what's on my mind is like, what would happen if we continue down this path and we become, like you said, the principality of Yerevan, surrounded by Turkey from all sides? How quickly will we pack our suitcases and go to the airport? 
like we usually do. And uh, what what am I going to take from my home? Because I don't want to become a refugee. But apparently the Armenian community, we just burst like a bubble. The myth of the great Armenian nation burst like a bubble. The myth of our military might burst like a bubble. The myth of the Armenian diaspora burst like a bubble. We just we just completely destroyed as a society. And what's on my mind is, will anyone in Armenia be able to lead any effort against what's happening? Can anybody here stop this, to stop this and save what we have? I share Hovik's optimism, but I think at this point, what we can hope for is at least save what we have. Will that happen? Yeah. I'm just hoping that may, maybe somebody will step up. And Arthur, I, I slightly quick to, to I want to disagree just a little bit because you said the Principality of Yerevan, uh, and since you called me an optimist, I think it will be the the Sardian Cascade Republic to be precise. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Where people will eat and drink and say that Turkey, we belong to Turkey. Have you heard one of the recent uh, interviews with his uh, cult members, who said? Uh, you know, we belong to Turkey anyway. He's our savior. We will follow him wherever. If you guys know an expert on cults, please refer them to me because we need to understand how to manage cult members. We have like 300,000 cult members in Armenia. You know that. For my thought of the week, Edmond Marukian, come on our show and explain to us the foreign policy differences over which you resigned from being Pashinyan's ambassador at large. Armenians deserve to know more about where each side stands, and you will preserve your legacy better by giving us an honest account of it. Okay, uh, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Arthur, for joining us very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Arthur. That was our Weekend Review show recorded on March 3rd, 2024. We've been talking with Dr. Arthur Hachikian, an international relations expert from Stanford University specializing in intervention. He currently teaches at the Russian Armenian University in Yerevan. So uh, before we say goodbye, Osped, I wanted to remind our listeners that we are going to be much more determined to increase our reach it takes a lot of time preparing for these podcasts, and we are doing it as a labor of love. We have gotten a lot of comments that the viewership is not commensurate with the amount of, you know, the quality of the material. I don't know if the self-praise is worth it, but, you know, I'm quoting what we hear from multiple people. And in the past, we have polled people on Twitter who, and asked them, would you be willing to contribute a little bit? So here is your chance, folks. If you want to help us out, go to our website. There is a little donate link. And all the proceeds that we get will go towards amplifying our voice, making sure, you know, we don't have any Western financing. We're not funded by the CIA or any other Western agency. We're just two guys who have, OSPET has dedicated the last more than three decades, I guess, almost four decades. Years. Sorry, Yeah, uh, almost, you know, so more than three decades of his life, we are committed to countering the propaganda. There's just, it simply is very difficult to have media that is objective and that doesn't have agendas. Let me just put it this way. That doesn't have foreign agendas in Armenia because of the market size, because just look at our subscription. Look at the subscriptions, even, even the successful, let's say, competitors of ours. You will see that it is uh, not enough to sustain funding that they need in order to produce quality. You know, I would definitely, if I had to bill someone for the amount of hours I spent on this uh, you know, given my professional career in information security, I, I would not, you know, you know, no people would laugh at me. So we're doing this as a labor of love, but we do need your help in order to help decrease some of this time. For instance, you know, if we could use some AI tools, uh, some uh, professional uh, design tools, uh, graphic design tools, we would greatly reduce the time we spend. And they all cost towards, money. Yeah, and they course. all cost money. And Hovi, just to give you an idea, or rather, you already know, but just to give everybody else an idea, we went at a clip of two episodes a week, all of 2023. We produced 104 shows. That is a little more than half-time employment, yes. basically. Yes. Each episode takes about 10 hours, let's say, end-to-end -end preparing, scheduling, talking to people, and then editing and publishing and what have you. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and uh, getting the show notes and getting all the right links, the facts checked and stuff like that, it's just Hovig and me, and there's nobody else. And basically, we've done it, like you said, as a labor of love. So... It takes time. It takes effort. We've actually paid for it because it is a labor of love. All the infrastructure that we use 
the services that we use, uh, like uh, running our virtual machines, running our you know Zooms and what have you, and all those things. But it does take a toll on our ability to reach out because we're spending so much of our time just basically producing the shows themselves. Yes. And when you go to that link, just quickly, uh, we would really ask you to become a recurring contributor. So we have three options for you to contribute. One is Patreon, and you subscribe to that on a monthly level. So, yeah. so like some of the, some of the fun categories we have is Lahmajun Luminary. I believe that's $10 a month, or you can become a Harissa humanitarian for $25 a month. Um, so that, that's the preferred option. But if you feel that a particular show really hit a nerve and really sort of hit the notes that you liked, uh, you can just give us a one-time contribution. We have a buy me a coffee link on there as well. And lastly, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you can send us a super chat. It's only it's not available from Armenia, but it is available from uh, most other places. And with that super chat, uh, you can send a financial contribution. Again, all that money will go towards helping run our infrastructure, increasing our reach, reducing our time so that we can produce more content and therefore, you know, get our message across to more people. So the three categories that we have is a surge sponsor, Lahmajun Luminary and Harisa Humanitarian. We had many more categories, but we were advised that uh, less is more. Frankly, like the, I believe the, the kebab contributor uh, <laughs> was really nice. Of course, we had like a, the, the, expensive uh, luxury class uh, pomegranate philanthrop which was uh, unfortunately also removed but we'll reserve that for future uh, purposes i think okay thank you thank you very much i'm asbet bedrosian and this is hovik manucharyan please find us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your armenian news the links are in the show notes thanks for listening we'll talk to you next week